Uh, Take your Bibles this morning and turn to Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4. Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4. Many of you will know this passage as the burning bush experience. It is familiar to many people who have studied the Old Testament, who have had time in Sunday school. It is one of my favorite stories of the Old Testament. It is an account of God's revelation to the man Moses before he re-enters Egypt and leads the children of Israel out. So my question this morning for you, without going into all the details, I hope you will read these two chapters at some point, especially if you don't know this passage. But my question for you this morning is, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Now, again, I'm not asking you to raise your hand or to admit in this large gathering of the campus body here to uh, reveal your deepest fears. But you know yourself better than most of the people in this room and can identify fears that you have never told to another person. The question is not so much what you fear, but what does your fear keep you from? What does fear keep you from? To... to, Um, experiences in my life seem to be rehearsing themselves in my mind. One was when I was uh, growing up, in fact, uh, one of the things that allowed my wife and I to meet was a mutual love of being in drama or theater together. And um, when I was growing up, I, I was under the theater direction of a particular director, and he was trying to get those of us who were, you know, just walk-ons. You know what a walk-on is. Uh, they don't have any lines, but they're supposed to, like, act their part, even though they're just walking on stage. And I would walk on stage, and, and he would tell us, okay, you've got to be larger than life. You've got you to speak up. Even though you don't have any lines, you've got to speak up and talk about something that sounds like you're in character. And, and, and most of us as, as junior high and high schoolers at that point were like, you know, it, we kind of sounded like that teacher in Charlie Brown, if you know. Wah, 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 wah. Okay, you couldn't understand anything we were saying. We were kind of timid, even though if we were actually in character, nobody would know the difference. And he told us something that I will never forget. He said, "Your issue is not that you are afraid; it's that you don't love your audience enough." You see, if you loved your audience, you'd want to bring them into this experience with you. I thought that was very telling. The other thought that's going through my mind is to to admit to you one of my weirdnesses, okay? When I was growing up, um, I was what they would call a hypochondriac, and it was bad, okay? Now, if you don't know what a hypochondriac is, it's a person who becomes a germophobic person, meaning I was afraid of picking up diseases and germs and sicknesses all over the place. Anybody ever feel like that at camp? Okay? (laughs) Just a little bit, okay. Well, and I can laugh at it now, but when I look back on it, it was not good. I mean, to this day, I still have remnants of it. You can ask my wife about it, and I'll give her permission to tell you, okay? But, I mean, I would, it was so bad that, um, you know, I would wash my hands literally probably a hundred times a day, and my hands would just start drying and cracking and all those things, and I was probably worse off for washing my hands all those times. Now, please, wash your hands, okay? Don't, don't stop washing your hands. It's a good thing. Um, but it even got so, so bad that when somebody introduced me to this term, psychosomatic diseases... Anybody ever heard of a psychosomatic disease? All right, so this was horrible because I knew that I needed to read God's Word. And I hated the stories like I read yesterday about Naaman the leper because I thought that if I thought long enough, I might develop leprosy in myself. It was horrible. I know I'm weird on that, okay? 
And I hope none of you have gone to that extreme. But I want you to know that fear keeps us from doing what God has called us to do. And honestly, I am deeply concerned, especially looking at the last four years in our country, specifically here, how fear has just gone off the scales, even among people who would declare themselves to be followers of Christ. I'm deeply concerned about that. And as you think about what you fear, think not only about what you fear, but more importantly, what your fear may be keeping you from in obeying the Lord. Here in Exodus, chapter 3 and 4, we come across the famous character of Moses. Now, a couple things that we should keep in mind just at the very beginning here. I think it's easy for us to isolate Moses into that character that we kind of forget the context of his life. The context of his life in chapter 3 is he's nearly 80 years old. Now, I know some of you are thinking, it's like, well, yeah, but that was in the Old Testament. They lived to like 600, 800 years old, so he really wasn't that old. Okay, actually, he only lived to about 120, all right? He's lived two-thirds of his life. He's lived two-thirds of his life. The first third of his life was spent in Egypt in history, and the Bible tells us that he was raised in the court of Pharaoh. Um, uh, history tells us that most likely he was a major military commander in the armies of Egypt. And then he came to a point where he wanted to break from Egypt, he wanted to deliver the children of Israel, and so he tries to do that. In the meantime, fear strikes him because he strikes down a person, he kills a person in cold blood, and he flees to the desert, and there in the desert for 40 years he becomes a sheep herder. Now, another thing for us to keep in mind that I think is important is Moses was not only a sheep herder in the wilderness of Midian, but his father-in-law was a priest. (laughs) He was married during that time. In fact, by the time we pick it up in chapter 3 and the burning bush experience, he has a young family. I want us to remember this main thought today. The word of the Lord must hold more authority. The Lord must hold more authority in our lives than our fears. Because we live in a day that we justify almost everything that we aren't doing because, well, I have a fear. I have a compunction. I have an excuse about why I'm not doing that. In fact, I do want to talk about excuses because this passage is wonderful about talking about excuses. Excuses grow like bacteria in the culture of fear. Okay? Excuses grow in the culture of, uh, in in, in the uh, bacteria, excuse me, Excuses grow like bacteria in the culture of fear. And so, if you feel like, hey, I have a lot of excuses, most likely those excuses are running back to some fear that has been festering in your life. Most of us don't like to talk out loud about our fears to other people. It seems like uh, some of that's changing these days. We're a little more free to talk about our fears, but our fears then become the great excuse for not obeying what God wants us to do. Well, I want to give you a couple things to think about here. And uh, really, the, the outline, if you want an outline, is the word of the Lord reveals his character. I think the first thing you have to do when you recognize that you are filled with excuses and filled with obstacles to doing what the Lord wants you to do in life, is you need to reflect on the character of God. Number two, the word of the Lord reveals his commands. Do not neglect that even though God appeared to Moses in a fiery bush, that he appears to us, we hear his commands through his word. Then number three, the word of the Lord addresses our fear. So let's work through these uh, just briefly in the next few minutes. Number one, the word of the Lord reveals his character. 
I want you to consider the character of the Lord today. Uh, the context again, uh, Moses is out in the wilderness. He's nearly 80 years old at this point, And he sees off in the distance, up on a mountain, there's a bush that's burning. Now, this didn't seem to be too interesting to him until he recognized the bush didn't burn out. So he goes and he says, I'm going to investigate this bush that's burning but not burning out. So he goes up and he gets closer and when he approaches, the Lord says, take off your sandals because the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. God identifies himself. Then he starts a conversation with Moses. And the first thing that God does is he talks to Moses about who he is. That's very important. Do not neglect who God is and who he has revealed himself to be. Please understand this. Moses was not a great theologian. As far as we can tell, this is the first conversation Moses ever had with God. Perhaps the only thing he'd ever learned about God was from his mom while he was being raised as a little child. Perhaps that's the only thing he ever knew about God. But it stuck with him, and he knew about God. Some of you, this may be your first opportunity to learn something about God. And you say, well, I'm not a great theologian. Some of you have been in an environment where you've been learning about God all your life, and you've been blessed by that. But I want you to understand, he didn't have the Bible. All he had was memories of things that he had been taught. And so when God comes to him, let's give him a little bit of a break and not condemn him for all his excuses, but listen to how God loves on him and reveals himself to him. I'd like you to understand several things about God's character. Number one is found in verse uh, 7. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. The same God that appeared to Moses is the same God that watches you. It's the same God who is with you at camp, same God that will go with you home. He knows you. And, and please understand this. This is a God who hears, sees, and knows. He's a God who sees, hears, and knows. Did, did you see it in there? The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. I have heard their cry. For I am aware of their sufferings. Now that word aware, I love that word aware in the Hebrew language. Um, the, the Hebrew word for aware is a special word that we often come across in the Old Testament. It actually um, is most often translated no. It, the, if, you've, if you like the Hebrew word, it's yada, okay? Uh, Y-A-D-A, if you were to spell it phonetically, okay? Yada. It means to know in the most intimate way possible. And God isn't just saying, yeah, I've seen those people over in Egypt and it looks like they're suffering hard enough now. I, I guess I kind of am aware of that. I, I don't think aware is the best translation on it. I think to know in the most intimate way is exactly what God's talking about here. And I want you to remember that today. God sees you. God hears every prayer, complaint, and thought you've ever prayed that you think he never heard, and he knows you better than you know yourself. Number two, he's a God who acts on behalf of his people, okay, for the benefit of his people. Notice, uh, we see this in verse 8, it says, So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land. Notice verse 10 as well. Therefore come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. God is the one acting. God is the one that's moving here. God is the one who's acting on behalf of his people. And then number three, in the character of God, not only does he see, hear, and know, not only does he act, but the Lord knows his own. In verse 7, notice just a little 
uh, phrase there. The Lord said, I surely have seen the affliction of my people. In verse 10 again, it says, so that you may bring my people. God loves to show his compassion, his grace, and his mercy on his people. So, when you are dealing with fear, first thing you need to do is you need to reflect on the character of God. Number two, you need to pay attention to his commands. His commands are actually quite simple in this phrase, especially because it says in verse 10, Therefore, come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh. Was this a complicated command for Moses? This was a one-step command. It was, Moses, you need to go to Pharaoh. I'm sending you there. This was not an option. This was not a uh, who will go for me moment from Isaiah. This was not even, um, well, perhaps we would associate it with Jonah in the Bible where God says, I want you to go to the Ninevites and Jonah goes the other way. But no, this one is Moses, go to Egypt. Remember, he's 80 years old. He's a family man now. He has a fairly young family. And he's thinking to himself, I don't know if I like this idea. Well, that's his command. Now, let's take a look um, at the word of, how the word of the Lord addresses our fears. Notice this, and Moses said in verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? I want you to look at his excuse, and then I want you to look at God's answer. His excuse is, who am I? Who am I among all the different people that are in the world today? God, why are you choosing me? I've been there. I've done that. I flopped. I failed. I don't want to go back there. I'm a family man. I'm well settled. I, I, I've got my comfort. I've got my routines. And so Moses puts up that, that excuse, who am I? Maybe you feel that way today. Maybe you are sensing the Lord directing you in a particular way. Maybe you read God's word and it's like, yeah, but who am I to do that? That's, that's for Pastor Lael to do. That's for my counselor to do. That's for, for, for my, my instructor to do. But that's not me. That's not me. This is how God answers that question. Verse 12, and hear this. He said, and he said, certainly I will be with you. But now... Now, this is, this is a cool thing. This is one of the best answers and one of the worst answers in the world to us as humans. He says, I'm going to go with you, Moses. That's the best answer. But here's the worst answer. Because most of us want to do God's will, okay, when we're rightly related to him, we want to do God's will, but we like some assurance that his will is what we ought to do, right? So we're looking for signs, aren't we? And so, I remember reading this a number of years ago, and, and I could tell you the rest of the story around lunch or supper or whatever. I'd love to do that with you, but let me just share this with you. Notice what he says next. And this shall be a sign to you, that it is I who have sent you. Here's the sign. You ready for it? When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. That's a horrible sign, isn't it? After you've done what I've told you to do, then I'll prove to you that you did what I've told you to do. Ever feel like that? You ever feel like God is telling you to do something from his word or, or, or from the direction of life at this point? It's like, okay, God, show me that I'm doing it, that, that I'm really supposed to do it. And the answer that comes back is, okay, just go do it. And when you've done it, then I'll show you that you were supposed to have done it. We get angry with God over that. We get frustrated with God over that. And yet, God is deeply pleased with those who seek to please him by believing his word. So first excuse, who am I? Second excuse, the what if questions. I won't spend a lot of time with these these, um, but I think it's important because I think we all do it. It's the logic that goes through our mind, okay? Please understand this. Our logic is less important than listening to the Lord. Your logic is less important 
than listening to the Lord. In verse 13, it says, And Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel. Okay, you've told me that I'm doing that. Um, And I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to him? Now, again, I don't have time to go into all that. That's a wonderful part of this passage. I just want you to to hear what he says. They may say to me. See, logic is always doing the contingency plan. We're saying, yes, but if I do that, it might happen that this will happen. If I go to Israel, they may say to me, what's the name of your God? But he does that again in chapter 4, verse 1. Notice, and Moses said, what if you will not... What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say. There we go. We're always afraid of what other people might say. You know what? They may say something rude or mean or what are you thinking? Have you ever taken a step of faith? And you knew it was a step of faith. You knew God wanted you to do it. And it's like, but in the back of your mind, it's like, oh, my family might say to me. My friends might say to me, my boyfriend or girl might, girlfriend might say to me, my, my co-workers might say to me, my classmates may say to me. You see, the what if flows into that human logic that makes our human logic more important than listening to God, and we must listen to God more than human reasoning. They may say these things. And how does God answer him? Well, he, he gives him his name, I am. He gives him three signs. The Lord said to him in verse 2 of chapter 4, what is, it, uh, what is in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. Now, that would be a nice sign to have, wouldn't it? It's like, okay, I, I'm, I'm getting this. This is no problem. But notice what happens with this. God says, what is in your hand? What do you have? Not what am I putting into your hand, what, what's in your hand? And he says, a staff. He says, throw it on the ground. He throws it on the ground, and what happens to the staff? It turns into a snake. What happens next? What happens next is not that he picks it up. He runs away from it. You see, God is getting Moses to confront his fears. He gets him to confront his fears by seeing a snake that most likely is a deadly snake. I think Moses probably is wise enough to recognize the type of snake is not a good one to be around. Okay, um, uh, So, so there, there's that. But, but then he goes on and, and then the Lord says, okay, Moses, now I want you to pick the snake back up. But he, picks, he tells him to pick it up by the tail. Have you noticed that? If any of you know snakes, okay, I don't like snakes at all, okay? Uh, But if any of you know snakes, if you typically pick up a snake, you're not supposed to pick it up by the tail. You're supposed to pick it up by the head, okay? Not by the teeth, but the head, all right? And and, and so what does Moses do? He goes and he picks it up by the tail and turns back into a staff. We see... Two other signs that God gives to him here. Furthermore, uh, put your hand into your bosom. He puts it into his bosom. He takes it out. It's leprous. Uh, He puts it back in. It comes out clean. Uh, God says, hey, if they are asking you or if they are not going to believe you, these are the signs that you will give to them. But notice that he's actually already addressed this in chapter 3, verse 18. Because God said, they will pay heed or pay attention to what you say. So, The point that I want to make is when the Lord is addressing our fears, first of all, you may have the fear of, well, who am I to do that? Number two, it may be, what if this happens? But number three, and I'd like to kind of end on this one. Then Moses said in verse 10 of chapter 4, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent or a man of words, neither recently nor in time past, neither yesterday nor in in history, Nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? I want you to recognize that each of you were made by God in a very certain and specific way. 
And in our world, we come to think that it is, it is our right to change the way God made us. I want you to understand that Moses is questioning, God, why are you sending me? I was made in a way that I cannot speak eloquently. I am heavy of speech. I am heavy of tongue. I, my words just don't flow from me. Why are you sending me here? And God's first reply is, I made you just the way I made you to be. But then he says this in verse 12. Now then, go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth. (laughs) Isn't that cool? Before he said, Moses, you're my man to go. Moses says, who am I that I should go? And God says, I will go with you. Now he says, God, I can't speak. And God says, who made your mouth? Obviously, I did. And number two, I will go with your mouth. Some of you play instruments incredibly well. And and some of you look at other people who play their instruments incredibly well, and it's like, I could never play my instrument like that. And some of you, that is keeping you from using the instrument, the voice, that which God has given you to minister to other people. You can come up with a lot of biological or medical excuses why you are not the most ideal candidate for something that God wants you to do. But hear what he says to Moses. Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth. And not only will I be with your mouth, but I will teach you what you are to say. Do you have excuses that are growing by leaps and bounds because you have some fear in your life? Recognize that God, our God, the Lord, addresses our fears when we say, who am I, what if, and even the polite excuses that we give to God. Please, Lord, not me, send somebody else. Please, Lord, I can't even speak. God has a great plan and a great compassion for his people. But we must pay more attention to the word of God and let it hold authority in our lives than fear. Because we live in a culture that exalts fear as the reason not to obey the Lord. Some thoughts for you today. As you go forward, uh, I'm praying for you. I would like to pray for you now, and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, God, that you know our fears, and you know our excuses, and you have answers for all of them. God, some of us here are fearful because we might get sick, or we're not going to be able to do what we were planning on doing when we got home. Or, Lord, perhaps even more deeply, we fear Because, Lord, you've called us to believe your word, and Lord, that may be a fearful thing. Lord, I pray for these students, I pray for these faculty, I pray for these counselors, that you would would help them recognize their fear, and help them to love your word more than their fear. In Jesus' name, amen.